Okay, so to continue our journey through Rosenshine's principles, this section is about questioning. And Rosenshine has two sections here, ask questions and check for understanding. And what he suggests is that in, from his studies, he says, the most successful teachers in these studies spent more than half the class time lecturing, demonstrating and asking questions. Questions allow a teacher to determine how well the material has been learned and whether there is a need for additional instruction. The most effective teachers also ask students to explain the process they use to answer the question, to explain how the answer was found. Less successful teachers ask fewer questions and almost no process questions. I think that's a very important um, finding and it absolutely chimes with my observations of, of teachers. It's a big variation. A big, a big, there's big variation across a school from one classroom to the next in a teacher's confidence in asking questions and the, their success in involving the whole class. And it's very common for teachers to get lulled into quite extensive exchanges sometimes with just one or two students, sometimes even just one, but commonly say three students who are giving all the answers and there are many, many students in the lesson who are not answering, not even thinking they're about to be asked to answer. And therefore, they're, they're falling back, they're opting out. And the teacher has no real idea of what they think. So, it's a, And that's a very, very different situation from a lesson where every student is thinking they're slightly on their toes because they think they might be asked to contribute. And it's so embedded that, that as the questions are being asked, they're really thinking hard. And... There's an inclusion there, there's an, there's an involvement of all students, which, which is a great sort of warm feeling of the teacher really interest, being interested in what anybody in the room might have to say. So I feel like this is a, a massive area for development for a lot of teachers to get away from quite shallow sampling of one or two students and almost sort of just go through the motions of ask, asking questions, it, almost as if the answers don't really matter very much. So when we are thinking of... Um, the, the insights from Graham Nuttall about what is going on in students' heads, you know, that we can't see it. When we're giving information and giving explanations, even asking questions, how do we know how what, what's being received? How do we know across a whole classroom of, of children whether or not what we think we're saying is, is registering? How do we know what they're thinking? Well, we, c we can't find out absolutely everything from everyone, but we can sample. We can, we can get a feel for the range of ideas, the depth of conf you know, knowledge and, and the extent of confidence. And really, for me, the most useful thing to, to think of questioning is as feedback to you, is how am I doing? And, this is, and, and Rosenstein says this in the Check for Understanding section. He says, effective teachers check stop to check for understanding. They checked for understanding by asking questions, by asking students to summarise the presentation up to that point or repeat directions or procedures. This checking has two purposes. A, answering the questions might cause the students to elaborate on the material they learned and augment connections to other learning in the long-term memory. And B, checking for understanding can also tell the teacher when parts of the material need to be retaught. That is absolutely key. When you're asking a question, you are basically putting yourself at a kind of 50-50, you know, fork in the road. Am I ready to move on or do I need to go back and reteach? And you've always got to be prepared to, to go back and reteach if the answers you're getting are suggesting that the students haven't yet uh, grasped what you're trying to explain. And very importantly, one student's response doesn't anywhere near tell you enough to make that decision because they might really understand it well and completely kid you into thinking that's typical. And because they were confident, they, they, are, they were the one that maybe the, who volunteered an answer and that's what you took. It's a very common issue. I see it all the time. So, and Rosenshine, in even a very early form of his paper, this is, I love this, this is from 1982, a, a draft of a paper he was going to give at a conference, typed up. And in this paper, he, he actually has underlined checks for understanding. It's, it's, it's clearly a, a big issue for, for Rosenshine. And he gives us some guidance even about how not to check for understanding. So, and this is, this is the thing that he, he, he identifies. 
simply saying, have you understood or something like, are there any questions is, is nowhere near enough because, and I, I think it's quite amusing almost when you, when you, once you've identified it, how common this is for teachers to say, is everyone okay? Has, is there, has anyone got any questions? Is everyone okay with that? Yeah. Are we all ready to move on? As if the silence that then follows is a cue to say, yeah, that's right. No, we're fine. Rather than the much more powerful thing of saying, tell me what you've understood. What, what do you think the method is? What do you think the instructions were? What do you think was meant by this or that in that story or in that explanation? What do you think John over there said uh, meant when he said this? Getting students to actually tell you what they think they've understood is immensely powerful for them and for you and to do it at a, at a reasonable sampling level in, in the room. I, people who've done my training will know how that I, this that I've, I often use this analogy and I, I allude to it in the Rosenshine booklet. I sometimes think it's useful to imagine that we were teaching questioning a bit like we would be teaching a class of people about to go and abseil by themselves maybe sometime next week. You certainly wouldn't do it just by saying okay guys look there's some ropes there's some carabiners see what you can come up with and you know I'll, I'll wait at the bottom and you know, good luck. You would definitely not do that. That would be irresponsible. You would definitely model and show them exactly what is expected. But then what would you do? Would you say, okay, is everyone okay with that? No, you wouldn't, because that would be, again, irresponsible. You're assuming that just because you've explained it. What do you do then? Would you Maybe you'd, would you just get one student, maybe? You'd pick a student and get them to model it and demonstrate. Would you assume that because one student could do it, everyone else could? No, you, again, you wouldn't. You would definitely, for something that, that's life or death, make sure every student had understood, could show you, could practice, could do it in a low stakes way before you put them in a high stakes situation. And you would you would definitely do that. So why don't we do that with other things? Well, it's because we don't think we have time. So we cut the corner. But my experience is that it's possible to sit in a classroom of children uh, where next to a child who is never asked a question doesn't know what's going on and the teacher never ever notices because they just have, have assumed their sampling from one or two other students is sufficient and it and, it, and it's very often isn't so we need a repertoire we need some tools to to get in amongst the students to, to find out what's going on and this is my suggested repertoire of questions so in a training day on this i would go through all of these and it's it, normally i would model this so in a in a presentation like this one where you can't see me do them it's it's slightly hard but i think it's important to imagine what this looks like so for example cold calling is is the name which doug lamov gives to this strategy in his teach like a champion and it's basically the default habit of being the, te the teacher deciding who answers all the time as, as the most common way of ans asking questions so when you ask a question you you ask it to everybody so they are all thinking you then select who responds after they've had some time to think that is a, a, a big shift for some people to literally shift from the tossing a question into the room and taking you know someone might just call out or a hand up if you just allow hands up and calling out there are children who will never answer your questions that's that's an absolute rule i, I would say because they just don't need to uh, and they they learn to be they become people who self-identify as I'm someone who doesn't really answer questions. It's a bit awkward, and they just let the other kids do it. Or it could be they would like to answer, but they just can't face the com competition with the the hands up people, and they, they, they it, it inhibits them. And I've I've known that with even very capable students who just think no, I'm not, I don't need to compete with that. So I think it's the teacher's responsibility to be inclusive by scanning the room, involving everybody, and you ask the question in this invitational way. You don't say, right, you, what What do you think? You know, gotcha. No, it's the opposite. It's, hey, go. what do you think? I'm interested. What, what were your ideas? What were you thinking? Do you think you can do this one? What, what, what do you think this might mean? And you ask them in this kind of, um, has this, this sort of invitational way, which includes the possibility that, hey, you might not be sure, but that's fine. And that's, that's really important. And if you do that all the time, as an absolute default, it completely changes the dynamics. It increases the level of engagement with the, with the thinking. And there are students who stop being these sort of slightly timid, opted out people. They just are part and parcel of, of the lesson. 
no opt out is part of that again it's a this comes from a, a teach like a champion and and essentially you you avoid students just sort of saying i don't know as, as a as a pushback but also it means that if students genuinely don't know you 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 revert to them to make sure they do know the the, the example i always give in my training because i find this is a, the highest success success rate in terms of initially people not knowing is to ask something like what is the capital of somalia and usually the first person i ask doesn't know and then ask another person what do you think what's the capital of somalia they don't know either and then i might open up and say does anyone know and then yeah maybe somebody does or i might just actually have to tell them well mogadishu is the capital of somalia but then i've got those initial people who didn't know so what do i do with them now what sometimes teachers do they're so happy with the person who's given the right answer they just shower them with praise and they just say oh yeah brilliant you you're fun, you're wonderful aren't you great leaving the unknowers feeling sort of slightly ashamed and i think that's that's problematic it creates a sort of mindset barriers so yeah you, you bring them back in hey so okay we've, we've we've heard it now let's just see if you can remind me what is the capital of somalia or where's the mogadishu the capital of get them to reframe the question it could be any any question a maths question anything and then you say well brilliant brilliant excellent so you know it now you've rehearsed the knowledge it's important to do that, not just to say, do you now know the answer, which they'll just go, yeah. You have to hear them say it, because I've, I've had that experience myself as a teacher and as a trainer. So you've just heard someone say the capital of Somalia is Mogadishu, and you ask somebody, OK, well, what did you think it is? And actually, they can't they can't say it, because they ha they didn't pick it up just from that, hearing someone else say it. And you, they go, oh, God, I'm sorry, I, I actually... It's gone, I, I didn't hear it properly, and they didn't know. So you just, you have to allow them to rehearse that knowledge not just state yes i know it which is again that rhetorical thing just don't do that don't ask people if they know get them to show you that they know it's very very significantly different and the other ones on here are, are ones that i'll go into say it again better uh, is, is one i often just talk about here which is it's the name of a strategy where you 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 again and form a pattern with your questioning where you accept that the first answer students give might not be their best effort and let's face it that's very common so someone might say you know i often use the example of a graph the graph has a certain shape you ask the student describe the shape of the graph and they say something quite lame like um it, it kind of goes up and you think well yeah okay but i'm i'm wanting more than that i want you to say talk about gradient and the, the graph has a curve and it's not quite as simple as it goes up but what you don't want a student to just feel like they've given a horrible answer and you're kind of down on them you want to say you want to help them to form a better answer so you say yeah great okay it goes up that's good but let's see if i can let's, let's say it again with the proper terminology and give a little bit more sophistication to the so have another go and they'll say okay maybe what does it increase the gradient increases slowly at first and then get steeper you go, yeah, that's better. And you, you, they've given you a better answer. And that's the one that you, you leave them with. That's a, a really good rhythm to get into. So teachers that do that, that OK, accept the first one, work with a student a bit and then for, let, get them to form a better answer. I have to stress it's not the it is the name of the strategy. It's not the instruction you give. So I have come across a teacher who took this rather literally and was in his lesson saying, pointing at the kids going, Say it again better. Say it again better. Say it again better. And actually, it was kind of, I think, sort of finger pointing. It wasn't really helpful. It, you're in, you're all helping the students form better answers, um, and it does two things. It makes the students realise that it's okay to offer my first thoughts, but it's not okay to just leave to just give simple answers, and that's enough. It, it gives the students the, the idea that what you're after is depth, but the first step to depth is a kind of whatever, you know, just do, just get going. And that's OK. And that bring, brings people in. So when we when we talk about questioning strategies, it's important to be able to remind ourselves what they mean. So I often use this sort of thing like a blank. Um, you know, what do we mean by cold call? What do we mean by no opt out? What do we mean by say it again better? And we need to agree our definitions because if we don't all agree then we're going to go off and, and think we're doing things which we don't really do and it's really good to enact this so in my training which i can't do here now i'd get my i'd get people in a pair i thought i'd model the pair share so in your pairs see if you can answer this question and I, what i love is is as a standard questioning st uh, style is to get students to explain things 
as if they are explaining it to somebody else. So this just really helps with them think through depth. So imagine you are explaining this to somebody younger than you. What would you say? And that is a really helpful, very common questioning format. Because that makes you think through the logic of what you're trying to say, the depth of it, the terminology. And, as, and of course, you have to be able to formulate your own idea. So we do this in pairs in the session. And then I go I model to people how we would answer it. Now, sometimes teachers do this thing of they'll say to the first people, they, they will cold call the first pair, which is good. I'll say, OK, guys, what were you saying? And that first pair will offer something. They'll say, oh, we were talking about the earth rotating. And the teacher will go, yeah, like, someone said something correct. Great. And then I think I've got to involve more people. So they'll go to another pair and say, well, what were you saying? Well, it was rotating. Was it anti-clockwise? Yeah, good. And then uh, then a third pair chips in and a fourth. And we get this feeling like between us at the end of the whole process, woohoo, we, we can explain between us why the sun rises in the east. But that isn't the goal, is it? The goal is for every individual to be able to explain it. So my feeling is when you're doing questioning is that you have to honour the, the depth of what you've asked. So when you ask somebody to explain why does the sun rise in the east, you need to hear them give you the fullest answer they can and help them get to the end. So you, and while you're doing this, you're f hearing what they know and what they don't know. And then you go to another pair and say, OK, let's see what let's see your version now. Let's see if you got what, what how would you explain it? And that second one is so important because in the second version, you get difference from the first. And often that is where you see subtle variations in understanding. If you just think, oh, I haven't got time, one will do. You often a kid into thinking either nobody knows it or they all do, or it's just rarely enough, rarely enough for one student's response to be in, in, um, sufficient. So you check for understanding. And then you do that as a regular pattern. I've heard your explanation in full. Right, let me check your understanding of what we've heard so far. A third person, let's check your understanding. If there's an important enough area of, of thinking in the curriculum, that's really worth investing the time in. And then you might do something like this, so consolidate. that You'd write down an agreed version of the answer. And then everyone else in the room can then check what they were thinking against this and say, well, OK, that I didn't have that, but I've got this. So you can't check every single student's uh, response, but you can do two, three, four, maybe, then get everyone else to check against some standard answer. And then you can use a resource like that to do a, a knowledge retrieval later. You can maybe say, Let, can you all remember the four steps we thought were the explanation or just use it as a reference for them practicing explaining better. So I think pair share is part of that whole process. It's I used to call it the washing hands of learning because it's something you should do all the time, which really helps your health. And think pair share for me is a really, really powerful lever for improving students' understanding because you magnify the number of students who are thinking, but it has to be done in a very tight way. You don't say, OK, guys, have a chat for 10 minutes. That can be terribly loop, you know, loose. You, you give them a very short time, two minutes, and you give them a goal. So I want you to come up with the four main reasons for X. I want you to, to see if you can explain the answer on the board um, to each other and make sure you could be ready to explain it to, you know, somebody, somebody else. Go and you give them a very specific task. I want five things, four things, three points or whatever. And then you when you stop the, the, the pair share, you say, right, let's hear your full points. You don't just ask them to give you one. If you're asked for five things, you say, what were your five? Because that, again, models the depth. If you don't do that, you end up undermining your own expectations. Students just think, well, they don't really mean five because he'll just accept one or she'll expect, accept one. Probing questioning means uh, g in involving little dialogue. So this sort of uh, are examples. And Rosenstein has some examples in his principles as well where questioning has a, a mini dialogue feel about it you you don't just say you know Michael what's the answer good Susanna what's the answer great Michael's giving the answer say okay that's interesting why did you think that or could you what else could you say is there something you could add and what about this and what about that and Michael's had a bit of a dialogue with you and then you do with Susanna so Susanna what do you think yeah that's good what about that are you sure is it always like that how did you know and you you it's not it's probing in the sense of getting deeper into their knowledge and helping them understand what they what they understand. 
So questioning should have this feel of lots of little mini dialogues that go around and their students get used to that that rhythm and it, it deepens their knowledge and it, it, it makes their expectations of how to think higher. I find this as a massive issue for some teachers. They, 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 they're constantly thinking, I haven't got time. It hardly takes any more time to do this. It, 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 it reveals so much more about the, the curriculum and the level of, of, of understanding in the class. It's, it's very, very powerful. So try to practice probing questioning. And the last one in the repertoire is, is um, using, it, well, one of the last ones, mini whiteboards. I mean, this is something which some teachers use well, some teachers don't. And I like to model this in a training by getting everyone to do it, writing something like this, everyone on their whiteboards. Show me, do you know what mendacious means? And we get everyone holding up their whiteboards. And it's an interesting how often adults don't know what that means. The tendency to sort of tell lies or, you know, knowingly give falsehoods to people or to sort of show their understanding of atoms and molecules. It's great to see a whole visualisation of a class of people. And when, I, when I'm doing this, I often tell the story of a teacher I worked with where she was doing a music lesson uh, where you know they, the students had been asked to listen to some music and they wrote down the features of the music that they could hear and then they showed it on the whiteboards and the, all the whiteboards were shown but what she did was instead of dealing with what she could see she just sort of panicked at the sight of all of these whiteboards and asked them to students to put them straight down again and when I discussed it with her afterwards she said the reason was because she kind of froze in the face of all this kind of incorrect information on these boards, she wasn't sure what to do with it. Like, how do I go back to each individually? She just so she just sort of thought, well, I just can't deal with it and moved on. But I, I reminded her that the reason we do the whiteboards is so that you see a sample of the knowledge the students have got, and it's information to you to respond to. It's not a test of the students; it's just feedback to you. So she could have, for example, seen that maybe the time signature was a common gap, so to reteach that, no one really understood. Um, that it was a certain genre so they they missed that so she could have retaught that but there were some good insightful observations or you know from what students had heard and she could have reinforced the two or three good answers and then picked out one or two key things to reteach that's it a nice simple feedback to me like what have you got right okay let me maybe f focus this on this and that's what it's about it's not about checking every single student's response that's not really workable the last thing um, is to to go back to this idea of process questions. So this links into the idea of metacognition, and there's a really good report uh, which came out in 2018, the Education Endowment Foundation report on metacognition and self-regulated learning, where one of the strategies they suggest is, and it's their number five, promote and develop metacognitive talk in the classroom. And this to me is exactly the same thing as what Rosenstein is saying when he talks about process questions, where good teachers regularly ask process questions and, and talk about how they know the answer and he gives some really good examples so my examples would be things like this you know when you ask somebody a maths question what is seven cubed you know the answer is 343 but that's not you know getting that right is obviously important but but it's not knowledge you necessarily have you don't just remember seven cubed so how do we know how do we get to the answer is is really useful so Usually people say they set, they did seven squared and times by seven, but how do they times that by seven? There are different ways of doing it. And talking about the method is what you're interested in so that everyone can see how their method can, can pairs. Even something like, what's the main cause of? You know, you might come up with an answer. Global warming is caused by, I don't know, people might say, burning fossil fuels, deforestation, or, or, or some answer. But what, why do they choose that? I mean, I think that's interesting. So... Why did you select that one from the others? Or, and sometimes students realise you realise they didn't really make an evaluative choice. They just gave you the first thing that came to their head. So you, you you probe and you think, okay, so you weren't really coming up with a main cause. It was just the first thing you remembered, and that's that's an important thing to discover. And and similarly, you know, with the poetry, you know, connotations. Sometimes people feel like they're just endlessly guessing what the teacher has in their head. What what are them? What am I supposed to be saying? So when we understand something, like like in the example on there, space is a salvo. Salvo, what is that? How do I know why he says it? What are you thinking? The thinking behind that is is really important. Of course, we might have to teach that to some students, but when students appear to know it, knowing why then, how they know it can be useful. 
this is a, an, a classic example of this in action. So here we have a, a question where on the surface it looks it, impossible to do to some students because there's no numbers, there's no data. So how do I work out the fraction, the shaded? So modelling thinking is really key. When you're given something like this, well, what do we know? Well, we know it's a circle. Circles have an area of pi r squared. So what's the radius? We don't know the radius. So why don't we just write radius on the circle? Because it's, it's up to us to do that. And we just show that we can label this the radius. And then when we label the radius, we see that actually the diameter of the circle is the same as the side of the square, because that's how it would work. So the side of the square must be 2r, same as the diameter. 2r times 2r is 4r squared. Pi r squared is the circle. So you have pi r squared over 4r squared. That's pi over 4, which is about 3 quarters. That looks about right. Boom. You know, that's 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 the answer. And you, the, the reason why you're able to do that is because you model the thinking, not knowing the answer, but 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 think that the process, the process is to think through what you do know and then to trust that the answer will be able to be found. So that's an example of a process question approach leading to unlocking the possibility of, of answering what looks like a difficult question. So that, that's, it's not just a, you know, a, a dynamic thing in the short term, it's also a, a modelling of how we do things, which is the metacognitive modelling, which, which is in the EEF. So there we go. Now, to just go back to the, the list, you don't need to use these strategies. These are not Rosenshine's names. Um, they are mine. They're partly borrowed. What's important is that you do have a list of questioning strategies because there's no point sitting around a table as a group of teachers saying, how's your cold call going, if we don't all know what that means. Bearing in mind that most teachers will be evaluating their own practice by themselves most of the time. Are you checking for understanding in your lessons? I don't know. And I, I know a teacher who sent me this tweet on of a picture of in his classroom, he had put in the on the window so he would see it all the time this this uh, what have you understood he'd written so in other words reminding him to keep asking what have you understood because he knew that it was a, a habit of his to just do have you understood and that type of thing knowing yourself knowing what you're good at knowing what you need to develop is absolutely vital so i do think when whatever school you're in whatever team you're in to make sure your questioning strategies have names and then that you can evaluate yourself the extent to which you are using them and to make them the default. It's not about, do I ever do cold calling? Do I ever check for understanding? That kind of doesn't make much difference. The question is, do I use these things as an absolute default lesson after lesson? So the students' habits are changing, my habits are changing, and we are constantly finding out the gaps in knowledge and filling them and making more students more confident in what they know because I know more what they know and that's it's, it's that two-way interaction so that I'm gonna I'll finish on that have a, have a think about your own questioning and see where you need to focus your energies as you continue to develop your practice